Out of Order, a quiz about politics. In the chair, Patrick Hannon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the show in which politicians try to prove you can come out on top if you rab it on long enough. For as Michael Hasseltine said, The essence of being a Prime Minister is to have large ears. And hoping they win the Prince Charles Lookalike Contest are our regular team captains Austin Mitchell, the Labour MP for Great Grimsby, and Julian Critchley, the Tory MP for Aldershot. This week's guests are with Austin, political columnist and John Major biographer Edward Pierce, and with Julian, Matthew Paris of The Times. <laughs> Our scoring system is a model of simplicity. Two points if you answer correctly, one point if you're incorrect, but funny. We, st <coughs> we start with an individual round based on quotations, which this time have a sour grapes feel. Austin Mitchell, who tries to pass the buck here? If God had wanted to make me Prime Minister, he could have done so. I don't think that is outside his power. Yes, well, uh, I am sitting next to the author of a major biographer, uh, and he's making various suggestions. Uh, we're wondering if it was uh, the man described as the Holy Fox in his new latest biography, Earl of Halifax. The Earl of Halifax? No, it wasn't, wasn't the Earl of Halifax. Well, it was a good one, though, wasn't it? Uh, someone rather later than that, he, um, who came close, uh, went to some oh, lengths to, tr to try and become Prime Minister. Ed is running oh. very quickly to Austin. <laughs> this, of course, an individual <laughs> round, as we know. <laughs> Ed is writing another biography. Ah, oh, now, he's given me two. I couldn't read the first one, actually. It's either Lord, ha Lord Hale or Mr. Sham. <laughs> Yes, uh, you've got it right at last. I think you can only have I'm one, very clever, one point I've got for that, that. For, um, <laughs> for going on a lot and relying on Ed's uh, excellent handwriting. It was Lord Hailsham saying that with the assistance of the Almighty, he could have made Prime Minister. Of course, had he become so, it wouldn't have been very long before the rest of the population was seeking divine help. Yes. Julian Critchley, who prepares to offer his CV here? Look, nobody ever said academic qualifications are necessary to become Prime Minister. I think there's a that little... could either be John Major or Michael Heseltine, neither of whom <laughs> did particularly well in their examinations. Oh, um, you were at Oxford room? with Michael Heseltine. It must be astonishingly bright. He's bright enough, but he didn't do much work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think there's... No, it, it's neither of them. It's can we not, guess? Can no, we guess? you can't guess yet. Just <laughs> hang on a second. I think there's a little hint in, in the fact that it begins, look, nobody ever said. Welsh. Neil, ne Neil Kinnock? Neil Kinnock yeah. is right, yep. yeah. Well, you better have one point as well, since I was so mean to Austin. That was Neil Kinnock denying that the job of Prime Minister requires academic qualifications. <laughs> Edward Pierce, whose eyebrow regrets are these? Without the winter of discontent, I would now be running my third government. Hang on, this has to be the Labour Party, because the Labour Party suffered under the winter of discontent. Austin Prime is writing Minister. back to you. No, no, this could no, no, be one no, of the no. great correspondences. Indeed, of the it could. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it could. And what he's written is Callaghan, and Callaghan was only on his first government. But I suppose it still has to be Callaghan. No, it doesn't have to be Callaghan at all. Harold Wilson. No, it's not Harold Wilson. Yeah. Harold. Yeah. Oh, we know. I, I don't know, know how you work that out. Right, Julian and Matthew. Julian. No, Dennis Healy. Dennis Healy. Uh, he, he didn't run any governments, of course, but he thought that if they'd won, he would by this time be running his third government. And Finally, in this round, Matthew Paris, who denies not measuring up here? I would have liked to be Prime Minister, of course I would. But that is a bizarre yardstick by which to judge failure. <laughs> Could be a lot of people, <laughs> couldn't it? I think I remember saying that myself, but I don't think I'm what you have in mind. Uh, God, we, we, any ideas, Julian? Uh, you didn't come... Well, you, came, you probably came nearly as close as this person, as it turns out. Uh, Harry Greenway, do you think? No, <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Dickens. Oh, somebody, somebody Ron Brown. Brown. Anthony Marjorie Beaumont Dark. <laughs> yeah. No, no. You're no getting idea. through all yeah. your enemies, as it were, <laughs> sticking them off seriatim. <laughs> Edwina, Edwina, Edwina Curry. Edwina Curry. Yeah. Must the list is too long. Curry. Don't go on. Yeah, well, it's uh, someone of noted ambition. Can we? Can we? Can we who, rec who recognises that he uh, can will, we will not become prime minister unless, well, unless there's an earthquake and a lot can of people fall in the hole. Tony Benn. Not Tony. Well, we're, we're, our guess is, is uh, Lady Howe's husband. What was his name? Um. <laughs> <laughs> what about David Owen? No, it was, it was, it's David Owen, yes, somebody mm. without a party these <laughs> days. David Owen saying he didn't regard not becoming Prime Minister as an indication of failure. 
uh, thus demonstrating uh, that amongst Dr. Owen's many faces, there is a brave one. <laughs> that brings us to the end of round one. The scores are Austin Mitchell and Ed Pierce, one. Julian Critchley and Matthew Paris, four. Oh. <laughs> Round two is another individual round in which we've scoured the sound archives for sound bites with a transatlantic feel. Austin Mitchell, who attempts to explain what here? When I graduated, upon getting close to graduation at DePauw, my desire was to continue to law school. At that time, I also made a decision to fulfill my military commitment to join the National Guard. The National Guard, which I served for six years, uh, very proudly. Uh, I was on active duty for six months. I could have been called up uh, to Vietnam, as other Indiana units were, and if I had been called, I would have gone. And I want to say something, that serving in the National Guard is patriotic. There is nothing... <laughs> well, it is very patriotic to serve in the National Guard, because you can go and shoot students at Kent State, but uh, I would have thought that was T. Danforth Quayle that was uh, precipitated during the election campaign, arguing that uh, he'd used his family's influence and, uh, and, and cash to buy himself out of the draft to Vietnam. Quite right. It was Dan Quayle explaining that by spending the Vietnam War in the Indiana National Guard, he was doing his patriotic duty, and that was later confirmed by United States Army generals who said that Mr. Quayle's presence in Vietnam could have prolonged the war by several years. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, Matthew Paris, who wants to let whom in here? Let's do what's fair. Let's do what's decent. Let's do what reflects uh, uh, the changes in the world. I don't think we have to go through the agony of whether Republic of China will accept or whether Peking will accept. Let's the United Nations for a change. Do something that, that really does face up to reality and then let that decision be made by the parties involved. Well, that's pretty easy. Well, it, it sounds like George Bush, so but I'm not quite sure what he's talking about. Ah, well, that's the difficult bit. It is George Bush, mm. but... He's whinging out of one nostril. Well, since he's never very sure anyway, you should give him it. <laughs> but I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to know what he's talking about, or indeed, when... It's a little while ago. He's deepened his voice recently. Um, Just so, like Mrs. Thatcher. Yes, yes. And John Major, too. No, I, d I don't... It's some time ago, and I don't know what it's Any about. idea, Julian? No. George Bush, in 1971, talking about admitting communist China yes. to the UN mm. and urging that body to face up to reality. The United Nations agreed, but only on condition that they could set up an all-expenses-paid, first-class, round-the-world fact-finding mission to investigate what reality was. <laughs> Ed Pierce, who denies what here? In the past several months, I've been living in purgatory. I have found myself the recipient of undefined, unclear, unattributed accusations that have surfaced in the largest and the most widely circulated organs of our communications media. I want to say at this point, clearly and unequivocally, I am innocent of the charges against media. Aspirity Agni, you mean? Yeah. Do you know what it was all about? Yes, it was to do with the allegations made that he had been engaged in uh, various dishonest fiscal practices or peri-fiscal practices and he was allowed to allowed to plead nolle, um, nolle contendendere which is Latin and, and highfalutin American for I done it gaff uh, <laughs> in return for a trade or deal or fix by which he would resign as vice president but would not go to jug. Well there we are that's, uh, that, that's would, a, a good law lecture. It was uh, to clear that up Spiro T. Agnew in 1973 claiming that he was innocent of the many charges of fraud then being leveled against him. His accusers felt that he'd overplayed his hand however when he cited Richard Dixon as a character witness. <laughs> <laughs> Julian Critchley, to conclude the round, who here finds whose joke unfunny? I'm willing to accept that he just saw it as a joke. I, I, I don't want to... But those words live. And they will be read uh, and listened to by the world. Could it have been Nixon? No, it wasn't Nixon. Sounds a bit plaintive. I don't know. It was uh, someone at a, a, a high a... level in American politics talking about somebody at a higher level. I don't know. All Americans sound alike to me. Kissinger. No, it, it wasn't Kissinger. We, we think it was Dukakis. No, it wasn't Dukakis. <laughs> it was ex-Vice President Walter Mondale wondering what the world would think about Ronald Reagan's off-the-record broadcast joke about oh, yes. bombing Russia. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, luckily, the world was just as baffled by that as, as it was by anything else that uh, Ronald Reagan said. At the end of that round, the scores are Austin Mitchell and Edward Pierce, five, Julian Critchley and Matthew Paris, six. <laughs> round three is a round that asks our guests to show that it's not just politicians' promises that are good for a laugh by telling us a joke. To give them some idea of what's wanted, we'll excavate an ancient gag for each of them and invite them to better it. First of all, a joke. It was a very hot day in Kuwait, and two members of the Emir's family were sitting on the toilet. Say, said one, do you think this is physical work or mental work? I think it must be mental, replied the other. Why? Well, if it were physical, we'd hire a foreigner to do it. <laughs> Ed Pierce. Now, this joke I stole with skill and spin from learned Rabbi Hugo Green. It concerns chicken and a pig perambulating through the western marches of uh, the Ukraine during the People's Democratic Famine there in 1937. And skeletal figures stood at the doors, too inert to seize upon this perambulating food. And the chicken said to the pig sympathetically, God, look at those poor people. Just think what we could do for them. As an act of charity, we could set them up in ham and eggs for three weeks. And the pig said, lower your voice, lower your voice. For you, it will be, for you, it will be an act of charity. For me, it will be total commitment. <laughs> you get a better class of joke at the North West London Synagogue. You read it first in The Guardian. Two, two points for that high class joke. Uh, Matthew Paris listened to this. At the height of the Northern Ireland troubles, a visitor to the province broke his spectacles and went to an optician who told him that they couldn't be repaired for six weeks. Six weeks, said the visitor. That's terrible. Isn't there anything you can do? Well, responded the optician, I could always board them up for you. <laughs> Ma Matthew You remember, or some of you will, that Tsar Nicholas II was a particularly indecisive Tsar in old imperial Russia and a visitor uh, to Moscow once inquired of his Russian host who the most powerful man in Russia was at the time and his host replied there are two equally powerful men in Russia the first is Tsar Nicholas II and the second is the last person he spoke to. <laughs> well, that's, I think that's certainly worth another two points. Brings us to the end of the round. The scores are Austin Mitchell and Edward Pierce, seven. Julian Critchley and Matthew Paris, eight. <laughs> this next round gives each team the chance to work out the identity of a well-known political figure from a set of six clues. If you guess the name correctly after the first clue, you get six points. The clues get easier, the points diminish. One guess per clue. Austin and Ed are going to start. The first clue for six points is a Roman letter led to a PS. Any idea? Got, got any names going through your mind? Roman letter led to a PS. Oh. There's a lot going through Edward Pierce's mind. <laughs> yes, but not, not the answer to XPS, this particular LPS, question. LPS, MPX. Oh, it's not as difficult well, as that, Ed. I think we, I think we better move on. <laughs> hang uh, on, hang on, hang on. A Roman letter, not of course a Roman letter, but a letter sent in Rome, as it were. Yeah. From Rome. Yes, not an alphabetical letter. A Roman, a PS being a parliamentary secretary, private secretary, uh, or alternatively postscript. Can, look, can you come back next week? <laughs> <laughs> Will he be finished by do then? We mean, do we mean PS in the postscript himself? Oh, come on, Ed. Give us a name. I'll get on with it. <laughs> I, I got, I'm going on to, this, to the next clue for five points. He entered number ten four years before he entered Parliament. Ah, he entered number ten, which is obviously not number ten Downing Street. Four years before. Is it? Right. Well, I think hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm, 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 Austin, I'm, you... Well, my ex the excuse I was given, if in a, in a bad state to the police, is, uh, sorry, officer, I've been out celebrating, uh, which is exactly what, I'm, which is what I'm doing this moment. <laughs> entered number ten four years before. Well, I, I, I can't wait any longer, Ed. I, for four points, uh, his knowledge of Mandarin helped him deal with their successors. Oh, yes. yes. The audience we know. know. We yes, we yeah, the, uh, Do we know. Julian and Matthew know. Yes, uh, Ed doesn't know. Yes, he does. Austin yes, he does. doesn't yes, he does. know. What a pity. Yes, he does know. Just give him a it's second. It's coming. Unfortunately, it's special delivery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, of course. It's Douglas Hurd. It's yeah. Douglas Hurd. I knew it all along. Right? <laughs> four points squeezed out over some considerable time. Uh, the Roman letter was the letter he wrote to Ted Heath 
uh, from Rome, where he was serving as a diplomat, and he ended up as his private secretary at that time. And of course, he ended number 10 Downing Street course, four years before he entered Parliament because he went to work for Mr. Heath. Well, so I, th that I thought that was as exciting as one of Douglas Hurd's thrillers. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was very good radio. Uh, <laughs> Julian and Matthew, your clues are as follows. For six points, uh, Profumo's weak spot gave him a shot at a weekly slot. That rhyme. Well, we all know what Profumo's weak spots yeah, were. I wouldn't concentrate too much, <laughs> too much on, on that. that. Do we lose points for hazarding a guess? No, you don't. Uh, David but Frost. Not David Frost. <laughs> uh, David Frost, many things, but not a politician, and this is a politician. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> for five points, he brought Concord down to earth in America. I think this is even harder than the last one, which is saying something. Well, it must be somebody who succeeded Profumo as a minister for air, and who would that have been? Oh, no. no? no nothing like that no. at all. Nothing like that at all. No, next one. He helped cash in our chips for four points. Well... He said. You, uh, <laughs> yes, e Edward Pierce knows the answer, but he's not going to get a chance to tell us. No, I can't think no, of can't do that. Time. He stood against Macmillan in 1955. Oh, gee, Kaufman. Gerald Kaufman. The mm. blessed Kaufman, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and the, the brief explanation that he wrote for TW3 on the Profumo uh, scandal, and he negotiated the landing rights for Concord in uh, the United States and helped cash in our chips as to do the microchip company and getting it uh, up and running in Moss. There we are. Anyway, you've got uh, three points for that. I was at Oxford with Gerald. He hasn't changed a bit. Oh, dear. No. I think we'll bring an end to this cruelty. <laughs> that is the end of the round. The scores are Austin Mitchell and Edward Pierce, 11. Julian Critchley and Matthew Paris, 11. Now it's time for a round that shows politicians can bring disharmony to the most unexpected places as we ask our teams to identify the unwitting participants on a couple of disco records. Uh, Austin and Ed, who's backbeating about what here? This, Mr. President, is a remarkable record. Far better than anything we have ever known. The bass goes on. The bass goes on. The bass goes on. The bass goes on. Let's go. Acid party. Acid party. Acid party. Today, every week, acid party. Even more frequently. Acid party. Crucial party. I think this is. I, th I think <laughs> they are lucky. With, they are lucky. With I, I think record. this is Captain Swing and the Rick Burners. <laughs> <laughs> That's close enough. <laughs> That's close enough for two points. Well, they, they, uh, obviously, the Acid Party refers to the Conservative Party, so I'm following your, your precedent. And I think that is the, the record which was prepared by Mrs. Thatcher's first campaign team for the election mm -hmm. against Michael Heseltine, and it was actually released in February of this year. <laughs> <laughs> it was a record by a group called VIM, manipulating actual recordings of Mrs. Thatcher, yes. Norman Tebbit, and others to make, make them appear to advocate acid parties. Now, for, for those who are unfamiliar with these functions, they're generally located in large, empty, deserted buildings, which means it's only a matter of time before one is held on a Friday afternoon in the House of Commons. I didn't recognize, uh, I didn't recognize Norman Tebbit. Was he playing the bicycle or something? <laughs> the bicycle chain, was it? <laughs> Julian and Matthew, who's speaking on the record here? When is she going to do something to help those people who cannot afford to pay their poll tax? The poll tax, 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 the poll tax. Got nothing to do at all with Labour councils. And the government has got it completely wrong. Isn't that absolutely true? <laughs> well, it, it's obviously Neil Kinnock, but yes. I wasn't quite certain about the first voice. That was a group called the XN Tricks, utilising the voice of Mr. Speaker and Neil Kinnock 
on a record called the poll tax. Uh, plans to make a disco follow-up of Mr. Kinnock's collected speeches were abandoned when they realised they couldn't fit one of his sentences onto the side of an LP. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the round, the scores are uh, Austin Mitchell and Edward Pierce, 13, Julian Critchley and Matthew Paris, 13. <laughs> Now it's time for another team round. It's called Off the Record. I'm going to give the teams an anecdote on a particular topic, which this week is hotels. They then have to regale us with an interesting story of their experience related to it. That'll be the day. Scoring will be in the tradition of the best hostelries, with me imposing a service charge for adding up the points. First of all, the anecdote. On arriving at a San Francisco hotel, Thomas DuPont, the American senator, found that the lady who had been the previous occupant of his suite had left behind a frilly negligee. He summoned the hotel detective, handed him the garment and demanded, fill this and bring it back. <laughs> Austin Mitchell. Well, the only uh, anecdote I can think of about hotels is uh, at the 1982 party conference when a Labour MP of amorous inclinations, uh, I say that just to show it's a small minority in the Labour Party, uh, <laughs> was staying at Most the, of them haven't got the imagination. At the Imperial, uh, uh, and had made, uh, uh, noted down somebody's room number and telephone number uh, last night, uh, a, a, a lady friend, and rang up in the early hours of the morning, it was about 6.30, uh, uh, and the number dialed, the phone was answered, and he said, is that you, darling? Uh, and a voice which sounded dreadfully like Michael Foote's <laughs> <laughs> answered, do you know who this is? <laughs> Uh, being very quick thinking, he said, do you know who this is? And the Michael Foot voice said, no. So he put the phone down. <laughs> uh, Matthew Paris. Well, this is far from the world of parliamentary delegations and is a true story of an hostel, if not a hotel in Bolivia, where I was uh, some time ago. Uh, it was really just a tin shack. It was, I suppose you would say, bed and breakfast. I stayed the night, and breakfast turned out to be a choice of only one course. They said it was soup. And we sat round this wooden table, and a thin, watery gruel with something beneath the surface that we couldn't tell quite what it was, was placed in front of us. And I started to spoon this soup. It tasted of nothing but gristle. And I fought as the level of the soup went down in the bowl, I fought against the growing conviction that it was what it was, the solid matter in the bowl. It was a cow's nostrils that were simply <laughs> placed in the middle of the bowl. That is breakfast in Bolivia. <laughs> I'm tempted not to award Driving any marks class. at all to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for reasons that I'll give in writing later, uh, I will give three points to Austin Mitchell and Ed Pierce and four to Julian Critchley and Matthew Paris. That brings us to the oh, end of the round. It may you. not be fair, Austin, but it's real life, just <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of the round. The scores now are Austin Mitchell and Ed Pierce, 16, Julian Critchley and Matthew Paris, 17. Oh, Now it's time for the round where the teams abandon their natural reticence about their colleagues' misfortunes and answer questions on headline-hitting backbenchers. The object of this round is for the teams to answer as many of 15 questions as possible in two minutes. First person to hit the button and supply the correct answer gets the point. If they're wrong, it's open to the other side. This week's round is entitled Ron Brown's Fool Days. And it starts now. When and where was Ron Brown first elected to Parliament? Yes, Julian. Leith. Edinburgh Leith. Do you know when? Oh, I don't know. Well, I, I, Ed, I'll give you a yes, go at that. 1979. 1979. I'd point each, then, for that. Uh, what countries was he later criticised for visiting? Yes, Ed. Afghanistan. And Libya. Af Afghanistan and? Libya. Libya. Libya, that's right. There's a point to you, between you. Which prominent woman was he arrested for lunging at, Ed? A lady called... Uh, oh, yes, indeed, Mrs. Thatcher. A lady called Mrs. Thatcher. Oh, yes, you've forgotten for a moment, haven't you? The point no, I, no, no I, ne I nearly skipped to the Knickers episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, hang on. Well, what, was it, what was he waving at her at the time? Julian? A photograph of himself. <laughs> no, no, nothing so terrible, Austin. A placard. No, not a placard. It was a pay slip. Why oh. was he suspended from the Commons for the first time, Ed? 
inflicting damage on the uh, mace. On, on, on the no, 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 no. That was later. That was later. Uh, that for the first time, I said. Oh. Oh. Um, I, I, yes, Austin. In, you you and rang an Ed speech. What a team. <laughs> <laughs> Insolence and argument with the speaker. Well, and I? parliamentary language. He called Nicholas Fairbairn a liar. Well, how disgraceful. Uh, point, <laughs> a point to you. Uh, why was he suspended the second time? Yes, Austin. The mace. No, Austin. Not the mace. Damaging property. Right, Julian and Matthew, do you know? No. More parliamentary rudery, I expect. Uh, well, it was a bit. He stuck a hands off Lothian slogan on the table. In, in, in the... <laughs> What did he drop in April 1988? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Hands off low there, slogan. The mace, the mace, the mace. The mace, at last. How amazing. Yeah. What, <laughs> oh. what was being debated at the time? <laughs> yes, Matthew. Poll tax. Poll tax is right, oh, a point course. to you. How much did he have to pay for repairs to the mace? Yes, Austin. It was over a thousand quid. Well, come on, I want a proper <laughs> figure. Uh, it's two million is over a thousand pounds. <laughs> it was well, a C say, from let, appearing let, on this program, <laughs> if you remember. Oh, never to be forgotten. Let's say 1,200. Uh, well, that's not right. Uh, Matthew and Julian, do you know how much he paid? 1,300 quid. 1,300. You're mm. closer. You can have a point. It was 1,500. Why was he again in hot water one day after his suspension, Matthew? Uh, he got into trouble uh, with a lady down on the south coast. It involved a broken window no. and, and no. knickers. No, it's not that one. Uh, <laughs> this is the, inc the incident in the showers, we The think. incident in the showers. <laughs> what was the woman claimed to have shouted that she wanted from him? Yes, Austin. Truly his mace, wasn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a point for Julian. Very close. Yes, do you know what she wanted? No, the answer was... Uh, the answer was his baby. That's what she wanted from him. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this particular contest. <laughs> <laughs> and now, as, as each team won as if it's time to join the monster raving loonies, the final scores are Austin Mitchell and Ed Pierce, 22, Julian Critchley and Matthew Paris, 22. <laughs> Now all that remains is to thank Austin Mitchell, Julian Critchley, Edward Pierce and Matthew Paris and to leave you with this explanation from Michael Heseltine as to why his political rise might have had an unfair advantage. I went up the greasy pole of politics step by step. <laughs> <laughs> Out of Order was presented by Patrick Hannon with readings by Peter Donaldson. The series is written and compiled by Michael Dines and produced by Diane Messias. And Austin and Julian's guests next week will be Michael White and Alan Beath. <laughs>